come down and uh, and meet you. I thought I had a better stash of these, but I'm down to just three books. I'll get some more to your office, but I just thought everyone on the school board and administration should have these books that list the entire makeup of the legislature and how to contact us, what committees we're on. Um, since I didn't have enough books, I grabbed some of these, uh, what is, get some of the same information, not quite as helpful, but, uh, excuse me, I'll leave those with you. But when I intended to come down to introduce myself and, and uh, bring you this stuff, I thought there's also a kind of a current issue that I would talk to you about. And it's and most of what I have to say, you probably are well aware of. Um, but I think back to my time on the Bangor City Council, um, there were a lot of things I wasn't aware of, like um, on the city side. And so what I want to share is that the Bangor School Department seems to be a very difficult place to apply for a job. Um, my wife is formerly a classroom teacher. She got recertified as an ed tech, uh, got the background check, the fingerprints, and then found it really difficult to apply for a job here in Bangor. Um, they wanted references from people she worked with decades ago. They wanted uh, the application process calls for um, recommendations or references on company letterhead, which is almost impossible to get in this day and age. My wife's employer would not uh, provide that. And I think many of the bigger employers won't. And if you look at the website, there's 25 unfilled ed tech positions, as you're all aware of and what the market's like. And some of the listings go back to February of last year. Um, and if you do a little more digging on the internet, you'll see that, and, and I applaud Bangor for holding the highest standards. And I'm not here to complain. I'm here to offer backup to you because the people of Bangor have always supported the school district and they will continue to, I'm confident. Um, but if you look at Brewer, they're starting Ed Tech 3. Uh, it starts above Bangor's top wage and it tops out about $6 more per hour. And they'll hire Ed Tech 2s. Um, you know, the difference between Ed Tech 2 and Ed Tech 3, as I understand, is two years of college versus three. And some of the people who are qualified as an ed tech too might have experience it with kids with special needs because that's where a lot of the deficiencies are as far as being able to fill these slots. My son is in project transition at the Bangor High School. This is his last year. I've had kids in the school system for 18 years. I know almost everyone in this room and I get the highest regard from kindergarten right on up through for everyone in the school system. I sympathize with the people running project transition down five ed techs and every one of those kids in that classroom has an IEP and the federal law entitles them to what, what's in that IEP. And it can't really, I mean, it's, it almost feels like a dangerous situation when you have a room full of kids with special needs and you're five people short. And I sympathize, we love the, the people and, and have the highest regard for the people running that program. And I'm here to offer backup. Uh, you know, it seems like, and just one other thing, uh, the state of Maine is having an awful time finding people to do direct care in group homes and in other settings. And the solution was we've gone up on their wages. It's going to kick in in next month. And, and these are the same people you are likely competing for as ed techs, and they're going to get a three plus dollar an hour raise. And these are full time jobs year round with benefits and, and uh, plenty of overtime. So I think as difficult as the situation is right now, finding you know, ed techs and filling these positions, it may get worse next month as these other, and oh, incidentally in Brewer, they're, they're not listing for any uh, job openings right now. So either the ed tech two or the higher pay probably has something to do with it. So I would think, you know, some of these are longer term challenges, but maybe streamlining the application process, considering ed tech twos, and there's certainly lap, lapse balances with these open positions. If there's something you could do with pay might help. So as a parent and as someone who supports the school system and has some opportunity to back you up and, 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 and pitch things to the public that may cost money, uh, but is needed, I'm, I'm here for that. So uh, I wanna thank everyone for what you do from, from, the, from kindergarten through the high school to the school board and the administration. And uh, just know I'm here if I can ever be of service. Thank you. Oh, and I just found one last thing. I found this article today. Shows Bangor student, uh, main student ratio is a wallet hub survey, fourth in the nation, excellent. 15th for academic and work environment, but 50th for opportunity and pay. So I don't know if anyone saw that, but I also left copies of that. And uh, I guess that's all I've got for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Perry. Next, we have superintendent's proposals and updates, action items. Superintendent Tager.
Assistant Superintendent Kathy Harris-Smedberg will provide an update on the reading recovery program. Going to magically appear. <laughs> Hold on. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. So reading recovery is a program for first graders and I'm just gonna give you some background information about it. Um, it is only for first graders. It was uh, for those who are really are struggling readers. They're intended to take our very lowest readers, but we've had to um, make some prioritizations because we are limiting the number of reading recovery students we have because we're finding that students are coming in with lower and lower needs. Um, and because of the pandemic, a lot of students are not where they should be. So we're doing a lot of more small groups and we're taking reading recovery students that are students that are probably like, um, they're not our lowest lowest, but they are students that have some struggles, but we think that we can get them up to grade level. Um, we find that there are less behavior problems once they have uh, more reading skills, higher rates of retention. Um, they are more likely to graduate from high school. And in Maine, 10 to 15% of children who have difficulty reading will drop out of school and can um, read. Those that are incarcerated typically have reading levels that you'll find at a fourth grade level. Not good. Um, we find that low reading achievement has long term consequences so uh, literacy rates are lower for those living in poverty. They uh, find that unemployment rates are higher among students who are or even adults who are not reading at a level that we consider proficient. They are less likely to attend higher education and they again have higher rates of incarceration so I repeated that one. Um, we have identified that early uh, research uh, research based interventions can help um, and that they have less need for further services later on, like special ed or Title I. Short term reading and writing intervention for first grade students lasts for 20 weeks. It is a very programmatic um, method. Uh, it provides intensive individual attention. So it's one teacher, one student. Um, and they are identified through common assessments and they are provide the services are provided by highly trained teachers. The primary goal is to help them reach reading proficiency, but we also find that it helps self esteem, their self esteem and self efficacy, as well as just you know, helping them get along behaviorally with their peers um, and to avoid other programs. Um, kind of went over that already. The components of it are phonemic awareness, phonics, guided oral reading, comprehension, and fluency, and these are covered regularly. We have the program at four of the schools, and the at four of the schools, they're not at Fruit Street because for, Fruit Street is not a Title I school. It goes with Title I programming, and that's how we are funding our reading recovery teachers is through Title I program uh, funding. We have 11 reading recovery teachers, five of them are literacy coaches, and six of them are Title I teachers. Um, we are part of what's called the Eastern Maine Reading Recovery Program, and there are 24 schools, 15 districts, and then this past year, 116 students received services. There are various levels after they reach the 20 weeks of what we're looking for. We want discontinued. Discontinued is the term that we really want. That means they've met the benchmark. Um, recommended means that they need further services. Often it is special education services, um, but they need more support than what um, reading recovery could offer. And incomplete means the program was not completed. It could be the parent took them out. It could mean that they had a lot of um, absences. A number of reasons. Um, moving is its own uh, category, and that's they started the program, but they moved. So they moved out of district. And um, other could be just something that doesn't fit within those categories. 
Bangor students last year, 11 students received reading recovery services, 47% were discontinued, 13% were recommended, 33% were incomplete and 6% moved. But please understand the sample size is so small that so we look at the 6% move, that's one student. Um, in the Eastern Maine cohort, you can see the comparison, 53% were discontinued, 22% were recommended, 13% were incomplete, 4% moved and 2% were other. It's somewhat similar. Um, this is our data by school breakdown. Again, realize that the sample size for each school is very small. So when you look at reading recovery, they had three students that received services, only one was discontinued, so it looks like a 33%, well, it is a 33% discontinued rate, but when you're working with only three students, that can really um, skew your data. Um, if you look at the district, though, 47% were discontinued compared to Eastern Maine's 51%, but you'll notice our recommended numbers were much lower. Um, here's some historical data. You can see that our discontinued rates are decreasing, but in a way it's a little deceiving again, because our sample sizes are so much smaller now. Where we serviced maybe 11 last year, there were times when we were servicing 30 students. Um, and the national data has not released actually its discontinued rates. Uh, they've pretty stayed pretty well, 56% for a long time. Then they had to dip down to 53%, and then they stopped reporting it out. So, um, but if you do look at how we compare to Eastern Maine, um, our scores are typically much higher. Um, we will say the students that were discontinued gained an average of 1.4 years of growth. So they gain more than a year's growth, which they need to do to get caught up. Um, if they were recommended, they made a gain of a year of growth. And students who were incomplete made an average of 1.4 years of growth. The average first grader makes one year of growth. So reading recovery really is an intervention that works very well. Um, and these are my resources that I have and questions that you might have. Member Sorg. Yeah. Um, Dr. Harris Medberg, it sounds like it's a very successful program. I'm 100% for it. What happens after they're out of re recovery? So when they go on to second, third, and fourth grade and on up, are teachers in the second and third grade level aware that this student may need some type of further intervention? Well, if they are discontinued, that means that they are at benchmark. They are at the grade level that they're supposed to be at. Um, and we find that students that discontinued reading recovery are able to maintain their skills. Um, they typically are not students that we're picking up again for um, Title I services or special education services. Occasionally they are, but by and large, if we can get them, then they end up maintaining those skills very well. Um, if we have all of our Title I schools are what we call school-wide, and that basically gives us the flexibility to allow students to flex in and out of Title I. So if we see that there's a need, there can be a quick intervention or there might be longer a list of interventions. Uh, School-wide is very good that way. So you can really target a specific need or you can have a broader scope, like comprehension could be hard. So you're working on it all year long. Um, does that answer your question the way you? <laughs> yeah, okay. that's great. Thank you very much. Member Caruso. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, have uh, <coughs> the, the, my question pertains to the number of students in the program. Five percent of you know the first graders. You know, we have a, usually roughly a class of about three hundred. Seems like a really small number uh, for the you know for the district giving the uh, free and reduced lunch in, in some of those schools. That's one question. But the second question would be, as we look at a full year of pre-K, I, I would imagine that first grade reading results would improve with a full year of pre-K, a full year of K, and then moving into first grade because we'll have them more uh, in an earlier stage. I, I know I'm kind of answering the question maybe <laughs> in, in the obvious statement, but again, the research behind that, I think we'd appreciate hearing. So if I, if I, if I want to try to answer your questions and if I don't, then let me know. So as far as having the reduced number of students that are receiving reading recovery, that is correct. We would like to have more students have reading recovery services. 
our title student teachers would definitely like to have more, but we have to prioritize. So then it becomes a matter of what student does not receive any service. So we're saying that we're going to have an increased number of small group instructions of like two, three students in a group. It's not considered reading recovery because reading recovery is very clear. It needs to be one-on-one, -on -one. but we can apply many of those same lessons and skills to that small group. It just takes away that one-on-one, -on -one, but it allows three students to be serviced rather than one. Um, and because we have a high number of students that are coming in that are below le grade level in reading, then um, we're trying to service as many students as we possibly can. So are you saying that more students are receiving reading, uh, reading recovery skills, but not necessarily reflect in this, in this report? Correct. Thank you. Right. And then as far as pre-K, pre-K is awesome. And yes, if they come to us in pre-K, then we find that they are better prepared for kindergarten, first grade later on. That isn't to say that if they attend pre-K that they don't need reading recovery services in first grade. But again, it's that early intervention. It's a able, I mean, they, they learn their letters. They learn some very basic words in, in pre-K. Some of them are even reading. We have, we have a number of students that exit pre-K reading at a very basic level, which is amazing. So, and if we remember, we have Vine Street is trying as piloting a all day pre-K, which we're very excited about. So I'm anxiously waiting to see how that data comes out. And I think that was one of the points I was making, the full okay. day pre-K would really impact yes. those numbers in a positive way. That's uh, what we're hoping. Well, uh, the research would indicate- I'm confident that will be- yeah, All right, I like that. <laughs> research would indicate that, so. Thank you. Thank you. Remember Surratt? Yeah, first, yeah, thank you for the report. And I, I don't know if I have a fully formed question, just I, I, I'm more wondering, I'm, I'm wondering about the Fruit Street first graders and, and what, what would happen to a first grader at Fruit Street that is struggling and, and would benefit from something like reading recovery? Or, and have there been conversations in the past about the kids in, in that situation. Um, and unfortunately, they don't have the opportunity to have reading recovery services. Um, it doesn't mean that they couldn't um, benefit by it, and they would certainly put it to use if it were available. But because our reading recovery is funded through our Title I, um, they do not qualify because they have fewer than 35% of their students who qualify for free or reduced lunch. Could we get, and maybe this is a conversation for another time, budget talks, but I'm just wondering, could we be creative in the budget to, to create a position for someone to do that work at the Fruit Street School with those kids? I don't, I don't I know. Again, I'm just sort of wondering. I confident in saying that Principal Fortier would jump up and say yes. <laughs> <laughs> he would love to have the services because it, reading struggles no no economic boundaries exactly, uh, right. you can struggle in reading at any socioeconomic level uh, but the way that title is formulated is purely based upon free and reduced um, whether they qualify for it or not that's part of the issue too i think is with free and reduced lunch being provided for everybody we're not getting the forms filled out that we probably have in the past so i think that's another way to solve the issue too yeah and, and i think this is good food for thought and i appreciate it for for future discussions around budgeting thank you and i have a question too thank you for this wonderful presentation um so are ell students included in this mix um with they can recovery? Be. Uh, they can be it is based upon again the universal screening that they have okay. um you should know though that el students automatically qualify for title one services okay so okay. they they can automatically get that service or additional help just because they are identified as el and they go with our ell coordinator so they're not part of them no, they can have both they have both okay okay so they can almost I'm... like triple dip because they get their teacher they get yes. their el work and then they get their um title work okay so what about the ones at fruit street school because i know we have and so they have they el services have ELL. but they don't have reading okay. recovery services okay. perfect and you know i i don't think this is um a surprise to anyone that will have approximately 50 mm -hmm. afghan families that are arriving to bangor if everything goes well so i'm 
assuming that we're going to have a big population of, of students that will need services that will need this help. So EL services are separate from title services. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So hopefully they'll double dip or triple dip. Yeah. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Oh, um, member yeah, Mandel first. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I had the same question as Tim, and thank you for answering that about Fruit Street. Um, so um, it sounds like teachers, administrators would love to have more resources for um, reading recovery. I guess I have two questions. Um, how, what, what is the cutoff for kids getting into reading recovery? Is it based on um, just whatever the so um, what I do provide. is I sit down with the principals, the literacy coaches, title teachers, and we go down through the data. Um, and then we look at a number of other intangibles that maybe aren't reading recovery criteria, like if they're in kindergarten and they missed a high number of, you know, they, they were chronically absent, then probably they would not be eligible or we would not choose them for reading recovery because we want someone that can do a full program. Um, and then if you, you have somebody taking up space that not taking up space, but taking a slot and not attending, and then there are kids that are in school that could benefit from that. We want to make sure that there's going to be, because there's so few slots, we want to make sure that somebody who's there will be there. Okay. Um, and then if we um, have worked like through CDC or not CDC, um, through special education services, and we understand that they're probably going to have a referral and we'll let the referral process play out so that they will get their services through special education. Again, we wanna have students that we think that we can really make a difference with, that we can, they're, they're really struggling, they are not where we want them to be, but that they have some capacity in which to say, there's a chance that they're gonna make benchmark. Okay, so if the, so basically you're, you have a set number of slots and mm -hmm. you go through your data and you kind of go from the bottom up. Like, Correct. That's exactly what we do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And you fill in those slots. Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be kids that are a little bit higher up who are um, not going to get the services, but who you think could benefit. Yes. If, okay. Yes. So is, is this something that, um, that some of the ESSER money would be appropriate for? Um, it's, it's possible. Yes. Okay. Um, I think one thing with, um, with reading recovery and it is so good but remember in a six hour day, somebody would might only see at tops eight students. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding that there is also a, a, a level of economy of scale. It's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but, the, but the payoff is, it sounds like it, it's, it's pretty very, phenomenal. It, it's actually very solid and it's proven to be very solid for many years. So it, it is, it's one of those interventions that works. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Remember, sorry, sorry. Here it is. Okay. okay. Any other questions? I think we're good. Thank you so All much. Right, thank, thank you. you. Next, we have another update. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to update you on Commissioner Macon's education workforce regarding OSHA rules and vaccination. You have this in your, your packet. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. Um, President Biden announced he's directed the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. To develop a rule requiring all employers with 100 or more employees to ensure their workforce is fully vaccinated for COVID-19 or require any workers who remain unvaccinated to produce a negative COVID-19 test result on a weekly basis before coming to work. So this is coming our way. Maine is one of 26 states that adopts the OSHA standards. So it is coming our way. We're waiting. Um, on the specifics from OSHA, but we believe this will probably start in mid-October. Um, I believe it's a very good thing. I think that um, we are at 87% vaccination rate for our employees, but we also do have some vacancies, as you heard earlier tonight, particularly in some of our support staff. So I believe that the plan, as um, President Biden has laid it out, is a good plan for us to start with, where we would um, recommend the vaccine, but if they do not want to have the vaccine for whatever reason, they would be tested weekly. Uh, we can, we can, you as a, a school committee can, can um, ask for a stricter standard, but I believe the standard the way it is right now is the way for us to, to start because we are uh, maintaining in-person learning 
but we, we do not have an overabundance of employees or substitutes. Member Surratt. Yeah, I was I was wondering on the testing piece, would who would who would pay or how would the test happen? Would they have to do it on their own? Those are all the logistics that we're working out. And I know it, at some point tonight, if you want to ask about pool testing, um, Christy can give you an, an update on that. But I believe through our pool testing, we may be able to do some of that testing through that avenue. For faculty and staff. Possibly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And report of resignations. Reporting the following resignation, Ad Adam Caspala, Boys B Soccer Coach, William S. Cohen School. Thank you. Next is business action items. And the minutes. I'm recommending approval of the draft minutes of the September 9th, 2021 regular school committee meeting. Can I get a motion? I'll move. And roll call. We need uh, roll call. Member Caruso. I think we can just. I think uh, you can just vote. Just yeah. vote. Yep. yep. All in favor. And we have two abstentions. Okay. Yep. So that becomes a three zero vote zero two. Okay. Does Warren does that carry? Okay. Because it's only there's only six. Okay. Yeah. The three zero two motion carries. Next, we have the financial report. Recommending approval of July 2021 financial report. Can I get him? And all in favor? Oh, discussion, sorry. No, no discussion. Okay, all in favor? Vote carries 5 0. Thank you. And next, we have extra duty assignments. I'm recommending committee approval of the following extra duty assignments for school year 2021-2022. Adam Caspala, Boys A Soccer Coach, William S. Cohen School. Daniel Magus, Girls B Soccer Coach, William S. Cohen School. Adam Leach, .75 Guidance Department Head, Bangor High School. Sharon Pelletier Ayer, .25 Guidance Department Head, Bangor High School. Jamie Jarvis, Senior Class Advisor, Bangor High School. Emily Thock Morton, Sophomore Class Advisor, Bangor High School. Eva Wagner, Sophomore Class Advisor, Bangor High School. Jonathan Deering, Chess Club Advisor, Bangor High School. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Members uh, Mundell? Just a quick question. Is the Chess Club a new club or is it is not a new club. Okay. And then um, I, I noticed uh, Dr. Leach and Miss Pelletier Air, 7525. Is that how it's been in the past? Is Do you want to address that? I'm just wondering if that's a shift or. It is. Dr. Leach has been spending a lot of time on the advisories that we're uh, putting together this year. Uh, given that we feel that's critical at this point, we have one shot to make it work. Um, we've brought uh, Sharon Pelletier on board to help with the department of responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. You do. And can we vote on that, please? All in favor? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a second reading of policies. I'm recommending the second reading of the new policy BBAB student liaison to the school committee. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. And we have donations, Member Sword. This down to see <laughs> to do it good. Um, yes, uh, following donations to Fruit Street School from Fruit Street School PTO, a cash donation to support students having a total dollar value of $2,025. To Mary Snow School from Girl Scout Troop 
850, a cash donation for school supplies, having a total dollar value of $625. To Bangor High School from the Elks Lodge, Bang uh, snacks and water bottles for students having a total value of $250. To Vine Street School from the Bangor Public Library staff, backpacks, school supplies for students having a total dollar value of $300. To Vine Street School from the Charleston Church, 14 winter coats having a total dollar value of $300. To Down East School from Project Linus, mittens, hats, and scarves having a total value of $390. And to Mary Snow School from the Charleston Church, backpacks and school supplies for students having a total dollar value of $200. And to all these people, I say thank you very much. Can I get a motion? Second. Thank you. Any questions, discussion? All in favor? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have uh, introduction items, first reading of a policy. I'm recommending the first reading of revised policy GDB-7 support staff compensation guide. Get a motion, please. Second. Any questions or discussion about the policy? All in favor? Mm -hmm. Motion passes 5-0, thank you. Next, we have a committee updates. Any comments or questions from the committee? No? Um, I do have a question for Christy. Can we please get a pool testing update? So all principals and school nurses have taken an onboard training, which is from the vendor. Um, the vendor is ready to begin pool testing with us on October 4th. So, uh, principals have ordered their kits. Two principals have received their kits. So we're waiting for confirmation on those kits coming in this week. Once they are in, we'll be ready to send out consents next week to parents. We'll begin the testing. Any questions? No, it's been a process. So it's exciting that it's coming to fruition for us. Thank you so much. We appreciate the update. Uh, representatives reports, member Sorg. Yes, um, tomorrow night there will be a board meeting UTC. Um, we're working with the main school management, same as this committee did to search for Dr. To Mr. Tager. Um, we'll be planning a search for a new director. So that's gonna be exciting. Um, I think we're gonna do a statewide search, but we haven't decided yet. It should be interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reports? Just a quick report that um, for the DEI committee, uh, Dana and Superintendent Tager and I um, are working on putting the different groups together. Uh, Dana and I will be co-chairing the committee. Um, we met several times. Um, the three of us will meet next month in October, and then we will meet with the entire group um, in November. So we're excited about that. Um, and any reports? The other thing I might bring up is that we're working on our suicide prevention committee and that um, Christy Babin is heading that up and looking for membership too. So I know that we can talk about that um, at some point. She'll probably reach out to board members to see if you're interested. Great, thank you. And I don't believe we have any reports, do we, Superintendent Taker? No. Nope. Okay. And we're zipping right through. Um, information items, some important dates. Uh, Thursday, October 14th is our regular meeting, 7 p.m. here in council chambers. Wednesday, October 27th, regular meeting, uh, 7 p.m. council chambers. Monday, November 8th, we're gonna have a reorganizational meeting with our new committee members at 11 a.m. here at council chambers. And Wednesday, November 17th, uh, 7 p.m. regular meeting here at the council chambers as well. And um, other questions or comments from the committee? Member Mandel. Yeah, I was just wondering if there was any discussion about the survey responses that are coming about. Yes, um, I think Dr. Harris Smedberg would probably give you a good update. She's been meeting with a lot of folks in a lot of different places. 
So we tried to get a lot of different ways for stakeholder input. So there were five in-person meetings um, and they were attended by parents, guardians, staff, teachers, community members, business owners, or representatives of those businesses. Um, then we also had a meeting with the Bangor High School Student Council. And um, there was stuff on social media that said that you could email or call me, which I did receive some. <laughs> Um, and then uh, Mr. Finney put out a survey that we received 72 responses. The survey generated 220 ideas. Um, an additional 486 ideas were gathered from the stakeholder groups. I would say the stakeholder groups were very um, informative and people had some really good ideas actually. Uh, the top priority the state asked us to pray uh, from the stakeholder group, what one stood out as being the most important. Um, improving air quality and repairing and improving school buildings was a top priority in these stakeholder groups. Um, every group wanted this done. Um, they expressed that they would like to see these funds used for work that could sustain us through a longer amount of time. Um, and air temperature control was a really important piece. <laughs> The second priority, um, so that one had 75 different input uh, suggestions. The second we had 60, and that was to address the loss of learning. And basically people want assurances that we are going to continue academic excellence. There's a lot of pride in the community about how well we do with our students as far as um, the job that we do educating them. And then the third priority with 46, we're mental health of students, teachers, and families. And interestingly, it focused more on things like outdoor learning, self-care like yoga or breathing, and supports and resources for families. Is there anything else you want from that? <laughs> okay. Sure. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> They really want to make sure that the airflow is coming in, but they also want to control the temperature of the airflow. Yeah. Um, and we have one of our uh, grants, actually, the whole grant is about $6 million, and that's on HVAC systems. And then this grant here, we're planning on putting almost another $6 million towards things like that. Um, we're finding that that is a very important thing to the community. They want to make sure that our schools are as safe as they possibly can be, and air quality is one of them. It's a big thing, a very big thing. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if, if Director Babin has information on this or not, and, and maybe it's a, a conversation that's that's ongoing. But I was, I was just curious about the suicide prevention committee and whether it's. Is it going to be what it was in the past? And, and last year, it was a committee that met just a few times at the beginning of the school year, gave um, feedback on the suicide prevention plan, uh, and then and then sort of disbanded essentially. Or is it going to be a committee that that meets consistently throughout the school year? Is one question I have. Is that yeah? So per policy, the suicide committee meets annually to make recommendations for the comprehensive emergency plan. Um, but in talking with Brian Bannon, we decided that we were also going to look at the wellness program committee and vamp that up a little bit more because right now it's targeting wellness as a person, but not whole person with social, emotional and mental health. So he's going to bring that committee full force and bring that for a longer term. Okay, that so sense. that so the the suicide prevention committee is the charge of that is folded into this wellness committee or no they're two separate they are going to maintain two separate so the purpose of this of the suicide committee is to review information from the state level and from NAMI and make recommendations for our emergency comprehensive plan um, but we looked at the local wellness policy also because we clearly heard um, members asking about that at the last school committee meeting and determined that that policy needs a little bit more vamping up and that committee needs to meet on a regular basis. And will the wellness committee be similar to, to drop of prevention, and Southern Penobscot and UTC that a, that a committee member will be on the, will be on that wellness committee? Is, is that the plan or are we still sort of Fleshing that out. Still fleshing that out. Mr. Bannon is new in his role in taking on that committee, um, but we had a deep conversation about it and looking to move forward to vamp it up on a regular basis. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Makes sense. So has has that committee, the wellness committee, has that been meeting nope. regularly? So it's not it's, yet. It's no. dormant right mm -hmm. now. Okay. Yep. Okay. And how long has it been since it's been? I believe they met last year, but I, I don't want to speak to that because I wasn't in this role. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we've got know. two newbies here. <laughs> okay. And I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but do you know the composition of that committee? Who was like, what representatives were on it from? Yeah. So we're looking to this year, moving forward, we're looking to have physical education teachers participate, the social workers participate, school nurses participate, um, administration participate, and community members. Okay, so any any representatives from professional groups like NAMI or um, PCHC or Acadia for the wellness they those people are represented on the suicide committee right um, I can't I Brian has we he's new Not to that role yet. he hasn't okay. had time to really get in dive into that um, but I think it's a conversation that we need to have moving forward um, the policy definitely need, needs to be looked at so that we can update that and then move forward with a committee mm -hmm. okay yeah. I mean my I, I would. I would highly support that if you decide to go in that direction, given um, you know all the resources that are in the community, and I'd love to see more collaboration with with folks who are already doing yeah a lot of work out there. Yeah, so. yeah, we decided it needed to have a little component there, for a, a bigger component of social, emotional, and mental health in there. Yeah, I'm assuming the policy is the school committee. Correct? Yes. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll look yes. At that and, yes. Uh, any other questions? No? No? Okay. I think that's it out. All righty. Can I get a motion for adjourning? So okay. Everyone in favor. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you.